Okay, what do you think? Six more weeks of winter, or does it look like spring is coming? Now for a great big blizzard, or like winter storm dangers. Ah, this doesn't look like very much. We're live, by the way. I lost my <clears throat> shelter. Good morning. Good to Here's see you again. Hi, everybody. You're thinking, oh, they are probably sad that they're not in Puerto Rico where it's sunny and 75 or 80 degrees. It's, it won't be there till noon uh, anyway. Yeah, well. It's been 70 in the, in the morning. morning. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> it's good to be back with you. We are very glad to be back with you. We're even very glad to be back in our Snow four country. season house instead of a one season house. It was a, it was lovely. It was wonderful being with James and Crystal. We did lots of things. Uh, um, have not in the mucho past had so much. Mucho divertido. Yes, very fun. Muy, muy divertido. I'm still working on it. Working on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we did so many different things. And now we've come back. I'm uh, very overwhelmed because there's, uh, Karen was just going through this big stack of mail. And of course, all the emails and all the things. Um, we have a funeral this week of a dear friend. Uh, another dear friend passed away just this morning. I won't talk about that here because I'm not sure that that's just brand new and, and people shouldn't find out those things on Facebook. Uh, come to church. But um, there's just so much, so much going on with the big snowstorm. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. It doesn't look like much. And yet... God has been with you. Uh, thank you so much to Pastor Rago. Uh, he did a fine job. Uh, and God has been with us. And wherever we were, the Lord was doing his work. So it's good to be back together. We're going to sing a really simple song. Um, I, uh, In view of the text, which is also rather overwhelming. All these things going on. A family in crisis. A family with. Uh, um, competition and hatreds and divisions and problems from this person and that person and the in-laws and the cousins and the, uh, all these things happening. Um, we all need to sing number 740. I am Jesus' little lamb. You probably have it from memory. <laughs> Jesus holding the little lamb in his arms. I can still see it on their wall. Hmm. I love that one. Um, let's see. Second Samuel chapter 13, 
beginning at verse 34. But Absalom fled, and the young man who kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. And Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come, as your servant said, so it has come about. And as soon as he had finished speaking, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and all his servants wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amehud, king of Jeshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. There's a lot going on here. Pastor rago has been, been covering this, talking about it. This is a family with many crises. Uh, you know, this is the model family, right? King David, with the liar and the Psalms and and uh, the man after God's own heart. But And yet, that does not mean he's without sin. He has a heart for the Lord. But his life is a mess. It stinks. And he has made some big mistakes. A man who, who has a heart for the Lord. But he's ruined his life. Noticed? Did you notice it says, uh, Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come, as your servant said, so it's come about. See, they didn't all die. It was just, just the one. Remember who, who Jonadab is? Jonadab was the guy who, who deviously set up the rape of Tamar, Absalom's sister, his cousin. Jonadab is David's nephew, the son of his brother, Shemaiah. His, his older brother. So David's nephew sets up uh, Amnon to rape Tamar, deceiving David in the private. Here's how you can trick your dad into getting your sister to come here so that, that you can have your way with her. And then Tamar is cast aside and she goes and lives with Absalom, who keeps all this to himself and, you know, plots his revenge. And and then it, he sets up this big dinner, and it's as if it, uh, David thinks that all his sons have been killed by Absalom, but it was just Amnon. And imagine, so so now uh, Absalom has run away, and he goes to live with one of David's enemies, who wants, of course, to take the prince in, because hey, you know, you're maneuvering in a neighboring country, we'll take you in, um, and this gives. That David's enemy is another way to, to get in at him. And uh, uh, David is, what are, what are all the things he's feeling? It says here that the king and all his servants wept very bitterly. They were joyful. The other sons are coming back. They're joyful that the other sons are not dead. They are grieving that Amnon has been killed. They are, he is upset that Absalom has run away. And yet, I assume, surely, angry with Absalom and yet loving his son Absalom and longing, it says, longing for him to come back. Comforted about Amnon since he's dead. I, does that mean because Absalom has taken care of or eliminated a problem that David didn't know what to do with? That his son raped his daughter. And what do I do? Notice who's missing in all this. Nothing about Tamar. She was living with Absalom. Don't know who's taking care of her now. Because they don't let Absalom's run away. Probably the household that remained. David's family. I know families like this. We all know. We are families like this. That's so well, awkward, my sorry. nephew, well, my cousin, well, my my stepson, uh, um, and and well, so and so. This is his third marriage, and so really we're connected this way. And then then and and we can't have these two these two families over at the same time because they hate each other. Or this happened one time, and so and so said this, and 
yeah, just the soap operas are based on as goofy as they are. Are you? Are there still soap operas? They're based on real life. They're based on people's mess. That's why I hate. I never watched those things uh, because they're too as as terrible as the dialogue is. I guess people don't have very bright dialogue either. Uh, well, they were they were almost real time enactments. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wonder if they just kind of ad lib those things. Else would happen, and then the next day, and it would drag on. Do you know where all this began? I want you to keep looking back at this as we go through the rest of Second Samuel and uh, the histories, the history of Israel. Keep looking back to Deuteronomy 17. When you come to the land the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and, and then say, I will set a king over me like the nations around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. Don't put a foreigner there. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Solomon will break that one. He shall not acquire many wives for himself. Lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. One, two, three. Horses, meaning... Military. I gotta have more military. More military. Wives. I gotta have all these alliances. I gotta, I gotta have more, more, more. Uh, and these complicated relationships. Gold. All three of these things. All of Israel's kings pursue. Saul did. David does. Solomon will. And everybody after him. David, before he was even king, had six wives, seven wives, uh, and and all these competing sons. And he created this situation for himself. If he had only done... In the, the next paragraph in Deuteronomy 17. When he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Le Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either the right hand or the left, so he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. He needed to write a copy of the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He needed to write it down, make his own handwritten copy, and read it every day. That's what God commanded. If you're going to be king, this is what you need to do. And David didn't. The first thing he did was disobey the first things God said not to do. The many wives and all the consequences in his family and all this pain and bitterness didn't have to be there. And how to handle it, it could be different if David would have been in God's word. Karen did this a while back we, uh, when short, shortly after she retired. Uh, one of the first things she did was take some lessons in calligraphy. And what do you do? You, know, you don't just make plaques all the time or wall hangings. So, so just to practice calligraphy and, and as a devotional act, she copied out the Gospel of John. Looks like this. It, it's quite a thing. Uh, and, and she did it in two languages. In English and Danish. She was brushing up her Danish at that time. And uh, especially, especially in calligraphy, to painstakingly, slowly, with attention, verse by verse, sentence by sentence, word by word, even letter by letter, to remain to dwell in God's word. And that changed you, didn't it? That made a difference in your life. What would you say? Well, especially whenever I hear readings from John, I have a sense of having lived there. Mm -hmm. And it made um, those events and those teachings of Jesus very 
meaningful. They, they are, they're stuck in my head. So God does not have a command for us. I want you to make your own copy of the Bible, you know, by hand. He doesn't say to pastors, when you become a pastor of the church and you presume to preach to other people, you need to copy out. Um, he doesn't say that. But our hearts are like David's. We desire to be people after God's own heart, to, to have the mind of God, to, to desire to know God and to walk with him. I think it would make sense for us to do this. I don't know what to, what to do yet. I, I think John would make sense, but then you've already done that, so I would feel silly, which is not silly. <laughs> that is that's really a, silly. That's one of my... That is really silly. That someone character. else did it, so Works. I can't do it. So, well, whatever. Anyway, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily do it in calligraphy or anything fancy, no, but just, just write it out. Every day, if we are copying out scripture and reflecting on it, what what book of the Bible would you do? The Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Would you do one of the Gospels? What should What do you think I should do? Uh, let's begin this. If I begin. Copying God's word in my own hand in order to to dwell in it better. What did, what book would you suggest we start with? Here's an easier way. Yeah. Just um, because I've done this too. This is a visual faith practice. Some people do the Bible margins and some people do other things. But um, a lot of them just enjoy writing out scripture mm -hmm. in different calligraphies or just lettering or whatever. But... Um, the pericopes, the readings for the week, mm -hmm. just to write those out after having heard the sermon or be, because you know what they or, are ahead of time, right? just to carefully write them out. That's a thought. That's because a thought. though, then you're not trying to get through a whole book. You're just approaching each week and say, well, I'm going to, even to start with, I'm going to write out the gospel lesson. Mm -hmm. And eventually, maybe you'll also add the epistle lesson. Mm -hmm. But in the Old Testament, the bigger all, the bigger the complex. chunk you try to accomplish, this is true. The harder it's going to be to so a daily just develop the routine. Is of it. a very good thing. A daily discipline is a very good thing. So the David's life was, and his family was a mess. My family too. Thank God, not our children. There's a there's, they each, everybody has their issues and their spiritual struggles. But, but people that we love, our cousins, our aunts and uncles, our, uh, we have griefs and problems in our families, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, among my family, which I consider our congregation is our family. Mm -hmm. And the other congregations we've served, we grieve for people that we know are hurting. As we're navigating all this, Let's do what David was supposed to do. Finding our way forward, let's 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 turn where David should have turned. And and instead of just fruitlessly longing after Absalom, let's turn to the Lord. Father in heaven, what a treasure David had. There beside him, at, at near at hand, it was there for him. And he sought horses and wives and gold and silver. Lord, he ought to have sought after your word. Father, grant that we may not miss the treasure. Allow us to see it so that we may follow you. Lord, if we can do this, take your word and, and copy it in our own hands. Bless this effort that, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, our hearts may be drawn to yours so that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you.
the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Good to be back. God's blessings.